So, Carl, welcome to Forty Podcasts. I just realised you are the first non-musician guest on my show. Oh, I'm honoured. Yeah. So I'm very excited to see where this goes. Same. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope I can come across intelligent. Enough. No, no, no. Just be yourself. <laughs> just be yourself. Um. So, like me, uh, you have an interest in photography. Mm-hmm. But I have to admit, I have to humble myself that you are far superior. <laughs> In terms of skill, in terms of vision, in terms of artistic identity, but I want to start off with going back to when you were starting off in photography and doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, thank you, by the way, just to interject because that was that's that's quite nice. I don't know how to take praise. <laughs> I don't want to come across then as like just because there was deadly silence. It was like, yeah, I know, <laughs> I know that. No, no, really, like, thank you. Okay, well, it's true. Well, you're going to get a lot of it this episode um, I was wondering if you could tell us um, if you remember your first memory with a camera in your hand uh, put me on the spot I don't know what age and I don't know what date or anything like that um, but I remember I was around my um, grandma and granddad's house and I used to be Absolutely fascinated. So <clears throat> to paint a picture, there used to be, because unfortunately my grandma and granddad aren't, aren't here anymore, but in their living room, there used to be this giant fish tank. And right next to it used to be a corner, corner, um, what do you call them? Display units. That's the one. Yes. Wow. There we go. Intelligence <laughs> straight away. Um, yeah. So in there was, there was that and there was these boxes that had these tubes on it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what are they? Knowing full well that there were cameras, but it's like, you know, what are they? Because the, the cameras that you know and that you've seen, especially when you're a young kid, is just kind of, you know, the 35 mil looking DSLRs that you, you know, that you associate. But this was, this was a, I forgot to tell you, actually, this was a roller flex. And I was just like, oh, what is this? There's like two things. Weren't, weren't. And uh, yeah, my granddad got it out and he was just like, be very careful with it. It doesn't work, but it has sentimental value and I, I just held it and I was just like this is just amazing it's just a beautiful looking thing it was shiny it was like whew, it just it smelled like it's going to sound disgusting but it smelled of old it just absolutely smelled of old you can laugh if you want it's not a problem um, it was just I don't know it was, it was a nice thing it was very ergonomic it was just Anyone that has used a roller flex will know that it's just, I don't know, there's just something about it. It's just very, it's weighted quite well. Um, but yeah, holding that and it was just like, it wasn't this kind of giant epiphany like, you know, blah, like, cool, you've got to do photography now. Right, I'm going to get a camera or get my parents to get a camera and then use it and steal it and all this kind of stuff. No, I mean, th- this didn't happen until later on in, in life. But that's my earliest memory of, of picking one up. And, um, I remember, uh, my mum tells me and still to this day that, (laughs) um, I was just literally sitting there for hours just with it in my hand. That's, that's pretty much my earliest memory. I would say. What were you doing with it? We just, just feeling it, it, just feeling it. Yeah. Just like wondering, um, again, I I can't remember how old I was. That's really bad. But I think I was just trying to work out how it works. Being told that it didn't work, but trying to figure out how it works. And it was just like, just like looking at it and just in awe of it. Praising it almost. Just, you know, turning it upside down. And I probably wasn't as, I was probably quite heavy handed with it. But to me, if my granddad told me something, especially at that age, I was just like, this thing is precious. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's more than my grandma's life kind of thing. Um, but, you know, that's... So, <laughs> it'll be kind of like a drunken thing. You know, when you're drunk and you think that you're really nice and elegant, but actually you're going like that. <laughs> so, me with the camera, I'd probably be like thinking that I'm going, oh, like that. But probably I'm just like, bang, bang. You know, I don't know what it was, but because I can't remember. But yeah, that's that's probably my earliest memory, really. And I never really, um, I didn't really study for it. I didn't really, um, 
only went to kind of A-level standard. And even then, I just kind of dosed about and I just did art and design. So I never studied it. Um, and the the kind of process happened where it's just like, it would have been about 15, 16. Not when I was starting photography, obviously, but really getting into music heavily, listening to it a lot. And just kind of merging them together, together later on in life. And I thought that was like that. That's boom. That's what I want to do. How long have you been doing photography for? In total. Um. In total. Since. Two thousand and twelve. So from two thousand and twelve to now, maths. I've had a coffee. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> um. Yeah, so that long. And then um, professionally, since 2016, well, 2015, 2016, um, as in being paid to do stuff, you know, not not at a professional standard, admittedly, at that early, early part, because again, it's a learning curve. There's no way that you can get to where you are now to, you know, how you were back then, because it's a journey, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, just... Professionally since, yeah, 2016, from 2016 to now. Your relationship with photography, is it a love-hate or is it just love? Uh, in what respect? Well, I think for me, there are drawbacks to photography. I think um, sometimes when you don't have good lighting, you have to lug around with the equipment mm -hmm. and without the equipment you can't get the the desired shot you want mm -hmm. so for me that i think that's a personal not a hate but a personal um pet peeve mm. it's all this extra baggage that you have to bring around with you you can't just bring your own camera that's it you have to have lighting you have to have maybe a diffuser maybe depending on what kind of shot so maybe hate is a strong word Maybe um, you're aware of its drawbacks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in regards to kind of equipment, I mean, as I was saying earlier on, like I, I prefer to keep things as simple as possible, keep things light. Um, it wasn't always like that. When I first kind of started out, you think that you need everything and everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you've basically got a tent on your back and you, you're bringing stuff that you just don't, you don't need. You're, you you overcomplicate things, but you kind of, especially when it's like your first professional shoot, you start to overcomplicate and start to worry. Um, and so you bring everything. But I think lugging equipment around, it all depends on your vision. If there's something that you really want and you really strive for, um, it's worth it. Yes, you might moan on the way there. You know, you might be getting a train, you might be putting it in your car, might be getting on a bus, whatever it will be, or even walking with it. Um, but there's if you have a if you if you have a clear vision of how you want that image or images to look, then it is it's totally worth it. It'll, it'll be worth bringing. I mean, when I was doing my first lot of uh, professional shots, I was logging around a generator. What's that? Can you explain to the audience that? Do you not know what a generator is? So basically it's something that just powers electric on the go. So a generator being pour petrol in it, pull the cord, makes very loud sounds, which is great when you're in locations that you shouldn't be in with for band shoots, like abandoned <laughs> buildings and stuff like that. Um, so to power my, my lights, because I kind of, I made do with the lights that I had. I bought these really cheap things from China. Um, and... I couldn't afford to have the the stuff, and also like equipment now is is obviously it's gone far surpassed what it was before. So you can you can get you know battery charged ones for relatively inexpensive for what they are, um, and I uh, yeah I used to lug around that or get the band to lug around, which was always funny. <laughs> so that saw some action, but again having to load that into the back of the into the back of my car, drive with it, take it out, having to put. Uh, petrol in it and make sure that I've got enough petrol 
And that was always dodgy because you'd go to a petrol station and then all of a sudden you just duck behind your car and you start filling up and they're going, what are you doing? <laughs> and I never knew that it was a frowned upon thing. Could, what? A lot, of, a lot of petrol stations don't allow it. To just put petrol in, just filling up, know. filling up a jerry can. So if you if you take out if you take out something where you need to put petrol in that's not in your car, and then you put it on the floor and you do it, yeah, some around my way, yeah, they go, they literally go on the tunnel and it's like, do do do, what are you doing? Right, pump number six. <sighs> and you're like, what? I'm just, I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's it's probably because it, like you could spill it, or maybe you'll have a Zoolander esque right. thing and you have like a. <laughs> petrol fight i don't know who knows but it's i don't know it's really weird it's very bizarre i don't get it so how many times did you do that <sighs> countless i can't i really do, i really don't know loads and loads of times if there's if there's uh any of my followers out there that are listening they'll know because yeah a lot but um and then it came full circle and the the ironic thing is now i i, I use natural light I use natural light with quite a lot of my stuff. Um, that's how I've evolved. But if I do use uh, flash, I just use my speed light. Right. Which I had from the get-go anyway, but I didn't think was powerful enough. Mm-hmm. But again, a learning curve from that was you're thinking for these shots. Like you look at a shot and you go, oh, well, and you analyze it and you go, okay, well, that light needs to go that way. That needs to go that way. And you'd take like three to four, and that's what I used to do. And again, that makes it more clumbersome and it makes it, it makes the time go crazy. And you just, if anything, the band starts to get a bit bored and it's a bit weird. But as I progressed, they got less and less and less. And I realized that all I want is just one light. Mm. And then I took a lot of my inspiration from um, people in the in the photography community that do musical know Tom Barnes. And he had this just look that I wanted to replicate. Um, and it was just so, it was so luscious. He would just use one, one flash. Granted, it will be probably like a giant diffuser. So it would be a giant octobox or, you know, umbrella, whatever it will be. Softbox. To diffuse the light. But there'd be one single point of, you know. And that was usually about... 45 degree from the actual subject and then up on a boom arm pointing downwards and you'd get this nice kind of shadow underneath the eye and then that's what I kind of not that I became came, became renowned for but people knew my photography through that um, and that's how I realised that all I need is one light and all I want is one light and it depends on the day as well you can utilise one light to you know, you can use the um, artificial light with the ambient and it works and it can work. You know, you don't need all the gear to make incredible looking shots, you know? So, yeah, it just, it kind of evolved from that. And I forgot what the question was. <laughs> this was the thing you were on about and I've I've completely done the exact same thing. Sorry. No, no. No worries. You're doing well. Um, so I think when <laughs> when you're when you're stripped down to basics, I think you're you're left to use your natural environment to make mm. the best shot you can. I think that takes more thinking. I was about to say, during your your shoots and your process, is it what was the ratio between thinking about the shot and taking the shot? You got ninety percent, ninety ten, ninety percent thinking and ten percent taking. Yeah, I would say so for most of the time. Uh, there'll be some times where you've got to think off the cuff. Um, you know, you don't know how the weather's going to be, and especially in England, you have no idea. Um, you know, the band could have a very strict schedule, and it's like, okay, well, we need to do it today, and it's like, well, it's raining. Yeah, we'll still need to do it. Okay, cool, and you have to think on the spot. Or, even worse, you know, it could be a very cloudy day, or even a very sunny day, and then you're on the way to the location, and then it starts to rain, and you're like, great. Then you start to panic and you start to realize that, okay, well, I've got this equipment. It's going to get wet. Did I bring this? Did I bring that? Um, but it's, I like to visualize and have a, like an idea board. I'm always thinking of ideas. It's what I was saying to you earlier as well. Like I'm always looking at light, always. doesn't matter what it is. 
whether it's you know the light behind you or the light outside or um just little pockets of light it doesn't matter I'm, I'm always looking at light and i kind of uh mine's gone blank what was the question i'm so sorry no it's okay so with the ratio between yes yeah, sorry yeah. yes um yeah and um it's uh i like to have a mood board and i like to i like to have a pre-planned visualization of what i want to achieve mm-hmm. um whether that's research into into other things whether it's a movie that i've watched the previous night um or a tv series whatever it will be um so i would say in that respect yes it's it's more thinking than what it is taking but there's still a there's still a lot of time because you've got to even though you have you know a very beautiful location you know if it's not right with a wall or a corner of a house or wherever the hell you will be that takes time as well and yeah. then you have to set them up and then you have to obviously you know get the exposure right and all that kind of stuff um but yeah it's I think it's, I kind of, I have different thought processes with different ways of photography. So with portrait stuff, I like to, like I said before, I like to have a pre-visualization of what I want to do and what I want to achieve and how I want to achieve it. And I think about it. Um, Whereas I find it very, that's the kind of business side. And to be honest, going back to the previous question, what you were saying is like, that's something that I kind of get annoyed about as well, is the business side of things overtakes the fun side. I find it very liberating when I go out with, um, you know, a 35 mil film or disposable or something like that, where I just don't, I'd like, I'm just out there taking photos, not thinking about it, seeing something, taking it, moving on. Not thinking about it, just doing it. Um... So I think it depends on kind of what I'm doing, whether it's professional work or whether it's personal work. But yeah, I would say it's more um, more what you said ratio-wise for thinking than taking, definitely. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think digital... Uh, the, yeah, everyone says when you're shooting film, it slows you down, you think, you have to think more. Mm-hmm. There's a limited number of roles that you have and maybe shots on each role. So you're more deliberate and not waste wasteful. I think with digital, you could run the risk of taking advantage of it and just not really thinking about your work that much. Sometimes yeah. I'm guilty of that. Yeah. Sorry, photography community. I, I should, think quite I a lot of people are, though. Quite a lot of people are. Yeah, I I do feel quite guilty about it. So these days... The thing is, I, I d- like, sorry to interject. I just like, no. I, d- I don't... Th- there's no need to be guilty about it. Um, You know, there's, there's plenty of photographers out there that just run and gun and they still come up with incredible stuff. At the end of the day what what you see hmm. in that three by two that one by one whatever it, aspect ratio it is that's what you're seeing on that it doesn't matter about the journey like so much about the journey me personally it doesn't matter about the journey of how it gets to that it's that that i'm seeing that i go oh that's quite cool that's quite nice yeah you know so what you're interested in what they're seeing hmm. and how they interpret yeah. their reality yeah yeah some people like using viewfinders some people like using um, the LCD screens on the back doesn't matter to me it doesn't matter mm. it's the ends not the means exactly yeah yeah sorry to interject no 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 <laughs> I was wondering if if there was anything else in life non-visual related that influences your photography like music does music influence your photography at all for example, it doesn't have to be music. Um, Anything that's not visually related. No. No? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. No. Um, no. I'm a very... I do read, not as much as what I want to, and I do read, but I can't interpret... I can put words of meaning with images but i can't do the opposite so i can't right. read something and then i can let my if, if i'm you know if i'm reading a novel or 
you know whether it be fictitious whatever i can interpret in you know an imagination of it like that but when it comes to kind of for it to influence my photography i can't for some reason my brain can't process that oh. and because i'm so heavily into like i've seen about light and um shadow how you know how it plays how it dances around you know how you can morph it how you can shape it to whatever you want how it can change a mood um and then put that with put that with a narrative and then put that with um you know a nice color palette mm -hmm. you know they're they're the things that excite me mm. um so i'm a very visual person yeah so yeah i don't i can't really think of of anything else that really kind of Because I can't even say other people because, again, that's visual. Yeah. There's other photographers out there and there's directors and stuff like that. that but, again, that's, that's a, it's still a, still a visual kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah I'm still I'm very, very, very visual. Visual orientated. <laughs> visual orientated. Yeah. I think with my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you feel with your eyes. Mm. That's probably a good one. Um, so, when you're reading a novel, you obviously, as photographers, we think in... We think in frames. We think what's inside the frame, the dynamic and the sort of <coughs> silent dialogue between maybe two people in that picture, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, if you're reading a novel and you're imagining, say you're reading a bit where they're having a conversation or the author's describing a place, when they're describing it, so you're saying you can't picture a picture. I can picture that, yeah, because that yeah. that's part of my uh, that's part of the imagination side. But yeah. I know unless, I mean, I can't think of any examples of it. But unless something that you know, it could be something that creeps into later in, like you know, I could read something and then a year later I don't realize it, and then I get an idea and it's actually derived from that book. Right. Um. So maybe I'm just good at storing. Mm. I don't know, but yeah when it comes to when it comes to reading i have i have an imagination so that i can picture what you know what they are trying to portray in you know in their metaphors and their similes but for it to impact on my photography again not in that actual moment it might do later on but so things you read now they could resurface as a photo possibly possibly yeah yeah needs time to, to I cook. think so yeah exactly yeah. yeah I think um visually something you know something's very striking and stays in your head which it's bound to because it's visual um for me anyway at least um literature side of things it probably gets stored in there and I just don't realize it and then boom it will you know there'll be something that will pop up and I'll just be like oh okay yeah yeah but then I think I just think that Maybe I'm fooling myself as well because I think, oh, I've had this brilliant idea, but no, it's just something that I read like two months ago. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Because uh, you like movies, don't you? Mm -hmm. You like cinematography. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, when I hear music, sometimes I can think of a very good scene, either still or moving, that goes well with that particular music. Okay. And sometimes music can really influence how I would take a photo. So, for example, when I'm actually photographing sometimes or before I photograph, if I know what I'm going to do for that session, I try to listen to music that is closely related to that feeling of that photograph that I'm going to take. It gives me a bit more, say, influence and it immerses me in that world. So when I go to take that photo... I know the, the vibe I want. I know the, the lighting, the tones. Sometimes I don't get it, but that's fine. That's a process. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, going back to movies, do you see things in your head cinematically? Or do you see things from just from your POV? Do you picture things as a photographer in your head cinematically? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Do you share that? Yeah, hundred percent. I don't necessarily put that through with my editing style of because I'm a documentarian at heart, so I don't really like to do that much post processing. Really, yep. Um, 
but yeah <laughs> yeah see seeing something that's got ridiculously good cinematography guarantees to get my mind flowing mm. but again that's from the visual aspect of things yes. but I kind of it's not necessarily the lighting the lighting I may not get right but I look at it and kind of go I know how they've done that roughly um, for me it's um, colour grading yeah. colour grading is like uh, you're a magician I don't understand how your brain works because I've been trying to do colour grading and I'm still not happy with my colour grading. I don't think I ever will be. Um, and it changes as well. It evolves. Which is a good thing. Um, but I'm always striving. And again, I th- you know, that's that's good. Hunting's always good. Hmm. Not regular hunting, just hunting for, <laughs> you know, for, for perfection. But you're never going to get perfection and you've got, you know, you've got to tell yourself that. But, it's um it's very annoying sometimes i get the tones right and other times i don't but oh, color grading it's just like you are a wizard harry i don't <laughs> i don't understand it i don't like whatever they get paid they need to get paid double mm. because it you know it makes it makes a movie absolutely it really does it and the really amount does. of work that it takes mm. just one scene one yeah. frame Right, so many layers, so many, um, so many things to toggle, and you gotta do that for the whole film, mm-hmm. depending on the mood of the scene. Um, yeah, I think you're right. They should get paid more. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, hundred percent. Because it, 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 don't get me wrong. Obviously, you know, setting it up in a raw format, so you've got the lighting. You know, you've you've got obviously the the skilled um, director of photography. You've got you know you've got all of that going on. You've got the scene, you've got yep. the place, whatever it will be. Mm-hmm. There's obviously a team that, you know, go with that. But when it when it comes to the crux of it, it's obviously it's the director. And then, yeah, okay, you probably will have the, you know, the, um, the, the dop, as it were. Um, but then you'll have the color grade. Mm. And they are there for hours just sitting there, just looking at, like, say, the same scene. And they'll be looking at the meti- meticulous things like, okay, there's too much there's too much yellow in that highlight. I need to kind of bring it down and all this and in the shadows. Okay, so we're going for kind of like a cold thing. So we need to put a little bit of green in there, maybe a little bit of cyan, maybe a little bit of blue. I don't know. Let me go crazy. Let me just w- wave my wand and, bring, you know, it's done. It's um, It's an art. It really is an art form, and I don't think they get as, as enough credit as what you know what they should do. You are you are essentially getting back a flat image because obviously that's what it shot at, and that's the reason why it's shot in it. You're getting a flat image that looks completely ghosted. It's completely lacking any kind of vibrance and color because obviously that's what the color grading's for. And they are they are bringing the vision of what the director wants through just through color. That's art. That's insane. Mm. To elicit emotion through color. Yeah. Yeah, so color grading for me. Mm. I think yeah. um when you're saying flat images, I think good uh good lighting from the cameraman when they're shooting the scene and also the director making sure it's okay. I think do you think having good lighting from the offset makes the color greatest's job a lot easier? Yes. A lot more in control yeah because they have it in the raw format already um they can they can pretty much see straight away that this is what this scene needs to be whether it'll be you know okay it'll be just someone slumped on you know next to a bedside table with their head in their hands and then there's like there's 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 like you know a lamp with um you know very tuscan warm but then you've got like um you've got like a, you know, a thunderstorm going outside or even, you, you know, they kind of fill the room with a bit of atmosphere with a bit of, you know, smog, mm. fog, whatever you call it. Um, just create a bit more atmosphere. Either way, they'll know to go, okay, well, that lamp doesn't, you know, that lamp's not going to be warm. We need to bring that down and make it cold. If it's, you know, obviously horrible outside. But yeah, I think, again, 
bring it back to photography is like I always want to get as best as I can in raw format what's there you know there's you, you can't add things you can add things but I don't want to add things in, in, in Photoshop but you you know you can um, you can really you can really make an image from obviously the you know the raw the raw format of it and it goes with any kind of art form but like you were saying about cinematography yeah it's it's going to make it easy for them because they've already they can already see it visualize it and say okay that gets their brain thinking and then they go oh you know and like i said they're magicians so they go Bring, and then done yeah yeah <laughs> and also um you were saying about how they see things and you know i think that's one of the positives of knowing what you want before you shoot because then not just during the shoot but also post-production the other things would be a lot easier mm -hmm. a lot quicker to get what you want mm -hmm. you'd have the set for hours toggling everything just trying to make sure but if you have a vision and you know what to do on Lightroom or Photoshop you're done in under half an hour probably yeah, yeah exactly photos. yeah yeah it's, it's like um, I was saying to you earlier like, I, I like sets I like to I like to make a, a narrative with photos mm. so kind of like a cinematographer really in, in retrospect just I just use stills to kind of mm -hmm. Instead of moving stills, um, but I, I just, I like to kind of you know take my time with it, and yeah, just I can't what you said. <laughs> I keep looking out there. Sorry. <laughs> so editing, knowing what you want, editing would be a lot quicker. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just uh, having something having something there pre-visualized and editing it. It's it just it just makes things a lot, and especially again, being as I'm coming from a documentary like background, I don't like to do a lot of post processing. So get it right more or less right I mean you're never going to get unless you are using particular film stocks and even then it's still a bit uh, you're never going to get skin tone right mm. um, so you know little sliders here and there but I don't really like to do much post-processing I'd yeah. rather it be as raw as I can really yeah as best as I can yeah. in raw yeah yeah. that's what we all strive for I hope um, <laughs> how do you personally and specifically improve on your photography what's your specific process on learning and evolving do you study your old photographs and see your let's say flaws in those photographs weirdly i don't mm -hmm. um and i've not done and i don't know why i don't know why because it's a good thing you know it's like weight loss it's like if, if you you know you you take a, an image of you when you were at a weight that you didn't like and then you take pictures and you see your progression that progresses you to go further and I know that's kind of chalk and cheese it's a completely different subject but maybe if I did look I could you know see how I I can it depends on how far back you mean do you mean from like when I first started or maybe even a few years ago okay like... well yeah I mean you kind of you do kind of see that on the you know on the old Instagram other social medias are available <laughs> um so yeah you you know you do you see that and i do see a progression and i like i like where i've gone and i like where i'm at i feel that it's taken me since 2012 2013 to now to realize i like where i'm at now you try things um they don't work don't be annoyed don't be angry it's part of the process don't get me wrong i was you must have done it at some at some point you you get frustrated but it's it's um you know it's the cliched thing to say you know it's it's uh it's a marathon not a sprint mm -hmm. you know and so yeah to to go back to what you were saying i think it's 
you know, you can look at stuff that you have posted and you, you can see the progression. Um, there's nothing that I've really regretted because, again, it's part of the journey. If I didn't do it, it's the whole thing of like multiverses again, mm -hmm. you know. If I didn't do it, would I still, would I be where I am now? Or shooting the way that I do now? Would that be a thing? Would I be that person that when I first got my professional job at a um, a nightclub in Leicester, well, a rock bar in Leicester called Retribution, don't know whether it's still there anymore, I haven't got a clue, it was a dive. They only had like two lights on the stage, but all I was doing was basically having my flash on, putting it on bulb, clicking the shutter, turning my camera. Right? And there would be two to three lights. Maybe not even that, because some of them were broke. <laughs> and there was the promoters there, and they were just basically saying to me, oh, you look like you know what you're doing. Because I was just changing things and doing stuff, and maybe they just didn't see that before. And I never researched on how to do it. I just kind of stumbled across it by accident, believe it or not. And I know it's a, I know it's a technique. I didn't know. And I'm not saying that I invented it at all because I didn't. But I was like, this is amazing. And I felt like I progressed then. But again, if I hadn't thought about that, would I have got to you know where I am now? Because that propelled me to then seek further with combining music and photography. Because I was getting paid to be there every Friday to shoot the bands that were there, even though there was hardly any light. But I was still managing to make something out of nothing. Mm. That was pretty cool. That must have taught you a lot. I think it did, yeah. And it also, um, I find it increasingly, worrying is not the word, but I find it, and neither is annoying, I can't really articulate it across, but you have you have new up-and-coming photographers that um, they're, I started, like I was saying, in this nightclub where there was hardly any light. And I'd be doing stuff in pubs for friends or, you know, I'd just, there'd be a band on. So I'd just like, I'd pay to get in and then like two quid or whatever it'd be. And I'd, I'd go and shoot it. But there'll be like one light in this pub and I'd, I'd be taking photos, sending them off to them. They'd post them. Well, not back then, but they would because I was doing like, I was, I was like, I was alive before <laughs> social media got rampant. Um, or I knew of a time before social media got rampant, but the I'd like email them off. Um, and you know, they would say that they would like them, but if I probably look back at them, of course they're going to be awful. They're going to be grainy. They're going to be, which grain isn't a problem, but this is digital grain. It's a different thing. And it's just like, it's all, oh, bleh. but you've got people now that that would be my first kind of six months, let's just say, right? You've got people now that are doing arenas. You're doing arenas. And it's like, you can't take a bad photo. If you have, you could do a crash course in a couple of weeks and, and learn the basics, especially with YouTube and all that sort of stuff, right? And you could you could get the basic settings. If you're in an arena and you take a photo, you've got an abundance of light, right? So then you, you've got that as reference and you're like, oh, this is cool, this is great. But then you can go and do something and it can be absolute dog poop. And then you get annoyed about that, but like, and it, it's it's not to say that they're bad photographers. That's not what I'm saying. It's it's the process of it, learning from the ground up. You know, um, it's very. I do find it very frustrating because there's so much talent out there, and it, it's it's fantastic and great. But I have seen people do that and then just give up mm. because they've gone to. Um, again, for instance, with, with music photography, they've gone to a lower cap venue and it's something that's only got, you know, your, your bog standard lighting. I'd be able to thrive in that because I understand from when I first started out with like one light on stage to now there's like the set, the seven lights. Ooh. <laughs> Hang on. There's lights at the front of them. So they're not silhouetted. Oh, <laughs> so oh this is amazing. And you're just like, Oh, you're getting all hot sweat. So <laughs> But I, 
I can react to that and I can, you know, I can, I can alter. They, they just, they seem as though they can't, just two instances, they seem as though they can't. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to name them, mm-hmm. but they're just, it's, it's frustrating because for, for how little time they did it, they were really good. They could have been good. And I hope they do, I hope they do carry on, but it's just, that's very frustrating. Do you feel uh, maybe privileged, but not privileged, grateful that your photography self was born in such difficult sort of physical circumstances like low light and you were able to develop such good knowledge and good intuition of lighting? Do you feel grateful for that? Yes. Photographing, photographing in these really low light situations. Yeah. I think I think a lot of people should put themselves in a... Very uncomfortable situations. I think that's where they learn the most. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you need to do that to evolve. Really uncomfortable stuff. Yeah, Yeah. like low light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really low light. Mm -hmm. And see what you make of that. But the the great thing about technology as well is is the fact that low light scenarios now are not really that much of a problem. Right. Realistically, I mean, if you, I'm not going to say you have the eye. Because ev- everyone's got their artistic merit, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say more: if you can read light, you can get a really good image from a phone. A really good image. Um, I I feel, in answer to your question about being privileged, I feel privileged in the fact that I've gone through that journey and I've learnt techniques modes settings from myself because i am completely self-taught sorry about that i am completely self-taught um and there wasn't the abundance of youtube um tutorials what there is now and learning that sort of stuff and i guess being very stubborn as well not not like you know, reading a book or anything like that. It's like, no, I want to do it myself. And yeah, from, from going from those kind of things to then shooting arenas and, and doing stuff for, for PR and, and, you know, getting emails and stuff like that is, that's a journey. And that's a journey that I'm proud of. Yes. There's been upsets. Yes. There's been annoyances. Yes. There's been things that have been stolen. Um, stealing's wrongs kids, (laughs) but it's, you know, I don't think I'd be where I am now um, and how I've evolved to the person that I've become photography wise, um, my vision and how I like to interpret stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. Really hope appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I hope you don't mind me saying, but you said before we started recording that one of your, well, your fear was loneliness. Mm-hmm. And you related that to your photography. Can you mm. tell us a bit about that, that relationship? Loneliness and photography. Um, You're doing a series, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not, it's, it's been a, it's been a year personal project of mine. Um, I don't necessarily have a title for, for this, but I will be bringing out a book at some point. Um, again, I'm not putting myself under a pressure of time as to uh you know as to as to what when I'm going to bring it when I'm going to release it how many images um I'm leaving that all up to me but I guess I depict emotion from and feeling from things that I guess I fear So with loneliness, um, I'm doing a lot of things with um, abandonment and isolation, a lot of portraits and stuff like that. Um, It can be people of portraits and it can also be just static objects. doesn't really matter. Um, But I don't really know where it kind of formulates. I didn't really know until actually you asked me that question, to be honest. So it's kind of could I mean your engagement with it and your experimentation with it 
mm-hmm. and your exploration? Could it be your way of um, turning it into something that's not a fear anymore? So the more you know it, the less you fear it. Mm. Yeah. Maybe on the, on the subconscious level. Maybe you're, you're not doing on... Maybe you're not aware of it, but maybe it's something you're doing subconsciously. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I don't... I think it's... Especially with... Obviously, that thing that's, you know, been happening with every single one of us. I don't know what it was called. It was something crazy. Something, went hap- uh, something crazy happened in the world. What, do you know what it was called? I can't remember. Anyway. I think it was in the P. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, famous beer I think I don't know <laughs> um, and I think during that I kind of realised that it must be horrible to be in and I know this is like dire circumstances but you know with that and to just to be alone and then I kind of reflected on that and you know I was just like oh, I don't know how you can I don't know how you can do it I just that freaks me out just being if you are i have a i have some friends that have that like i'd like to think that i've i've got confidence um but they they've one of them in particular um he had to he he basically lost his job through covid that's what it was called i remember now oh yeah covid guys <laughs> um and still- yeah he lost his job through covid so he then had like a month of, of just nothing and then he managed to get an interview. But this interview, bearing in mind he lives near me in uh, in East Midlands and he had to go to Peterborough. So he had to literally up sticks, go to Peterborough, he's by himself and he's still there now. And he's probably, he's not a massive introvert, but he's not as like boisterous as what I would be, let's say, you know, but... I, f- I commend him for what he did because that to me is ridiculously brave and I if I was by myself I don't know whether I could do like I could do it because I find that the thing of being away from friends and family which is what he is being by himself and especially with then isolation and lockdown and all that sort of stuff to me I can keep my mind with photography occupied but that's only going to take certain time and like just I don't know just being putting myself in his shoes I freak out not that I do anything crazy it's just I don't know just the thought of just literally being in a house by myself freaks me out and I think that's that's where I then I like to portray emotion with my with my photography and I like I've said it before where if uh, if I if I feel something in the photo I hope that you do too or even better, you you know, you might take a positive from it. Um, people, different people's eyes see things, you know, completely differently. Something that I think is despair, they could think, oh, well, actually, that's like a beautiful butterfly that's, you know, just come out from wherever. I don't know what metaphor I'm trying to say. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think that's what I depict as emotion. Emotion I know is happiness. Emotion I know is, is, um, is is loving and is is love and is it, you know is fear. I I know about emotions. It's that's what I think in my head grades as something that can shock or something that can, um, for a better word, um, make you think. Mm-hmm. And that's what I try and portray in my in my photography. So maybe that question that you asked me, you know, before we got rolling with this, like that actually, like, oh, hang on. It just came out of nowhere. Like usually, I like to think about stuff like that, but I was just like loneliness. And maybe again, it might be one of those things. Like with literature, I keep it stored up there, and then it just comes out. And maybe that's what I mean by portraying emotion and through in my, you know, my photography. That's what I consider as my, as my fear. So my emotion to put across to people, not to be lonely, obviously, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think that's why my work probably goes the way that it does mm-hmm. maybe has a picture of someone else's made you emotional or cried or teary 
or do images mm. not do that to you? No, and that's the weird thing. <laughs> so I don't know what I am right now. You put me on the spot. I'm so but sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's like um, so I like to portray a sense of 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 loneliness and you know isolation. I, I, I want to make you just go wow. But then I could look at another artist's photo and just be like, that's really cool. I don't think of it being like well, that makes me lonely. Yeah. Or <laughs> you know whatever it will be. Yeah. You know, and I don't want people to think like that through my. Yeah. I, I, all I want to do the main catalyst is emotion. I want for people to to look at my. Uh, photo work whether it's my portrait whether it's my music stuff and I want you to kind of I want you to feel something feel an emotion that's probably the key words the strong the yeah the power words um but no I've I've don't I don't recall seeing anybody else's work and 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 crying um I get you know I get the whole kind of like oh wow you know but then is that because of the photo, or is that because I'm looking at it and analysing it and going, oh, I kind of think I know how he's done that or she's done that. I, you know, the lighting's amazing. Oh, I wonder if I can... And then that comes from the visualisation of things mm-hmm. where I look at it and go, oh, maybe I can utilise that in an idea. And then I, you know, type that up on my notes or I write it down. You know. So well, I, I was just thinking, um, the only photos I would probably cry to, I think I have a few times I'm not ashamed to admit are childhood photos okay so you probably thought photos in the artistic sense so those kind of photos but see just just photographs in general I never even thought about that how weird is that <laughs> I didn't even think about the mundane the the the, the general the general photographs never even thought about that I just literally thought of it in an artistic sense. I don't know what that says about me. This feels like I need a red couch right now. <laughs> Am I paying you for this? <laughs> I'll let you know my rates when the yeah, camera's Yeah, yeah, invoice. invoice. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, what, what can you, what do you have to say about that? Like just photographs. About family photos. Yeah, just, just photographs in general. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the stuff that I can look back on um with with fond memories but i don't i don't really have any kind of emotional attachment to them as in a physical emotion right uh mentally i'll have one where it's just like oh you know that you know that makes me sad um but i don't think i've ever i don't recall anyway um of getting that upset while seeing a photo. And I mean, I had to, um, <laughs> because my dad ordered me to, but I've just felt really, really awkward doing it. Um, when my grandma had passed, um, literally the last time that we seen her and he said, just get, just get a, go and get a photo. I was like, I, dad, I feel weird doing this. And he was like, trust me, just get a photo. So, um, she, I, I took the photo and she passed that, that night which is really bizarre but i look at that photo and i don't i i don't have sad um physical emotion to it i just i think of the good times with that which again is weird because with my photos i again i don't i don't force you to have an opinion of it being a sad emotion that you get from my photography you know you could see something different like i do just then you know um I I could flip it and say that maybe I have but it's been happy not in a kind of sad sense one single tear <laughs> <laughs> one single tear uh, yeah I I can see what you mean but when I look at vo- like family photos all I I don't see the photo behind my eyes I'm writing the 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 scene of that backstory so you, I, you may think I'm looking at the photo, but I'm actually thinking of the story behind it. Mm. It might not be a good photo. It might be a very, very shoddy composition. Blurry face, some light streaks. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the, the story behind it. Yeah. I think those, for me, are the most powerful, I think. It, it could be the worst 
artistically, objectively, mm -hmm. the worst photo ever. But if there was a an emotional story behind it, I think mm -hmm. I'll see it as a really great photo. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You tie that in with it. There's there's all this um, there's all this stick about you know being pin sharp with your focus with mm. certain things. And don't get me wrong, with certain aspects, of course you got to be. You know, it has to be. But again, coming from a documentarian background, it's like if there is blur, if there is movement, great. If things are out of focus, great. But that all depends on, you know, what I'm actually actually doing. I mean, if I'm doing a close up of, of someone's face and the eyes aren't popping with, you know, with sharpness, then of course I'm going to be a bit annoyed because that's the whole purpose of being that close. Um, but even then, that's again, that's that's artistic merit, you know. Mm -hmm. You could somebody else could do do different, but yeah, hundred percent agree. Like, it, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the best photo. It really doesn't. You know, it's something that you know it could be Chi Chi in the <laughs> garden. You know, and you lost your dog. Mm. Um, friends reference there, Chi Chi. <laughs> but yeah, it, it it could be, it could be anything, and it just could be just your dog, for example, um, in your garden, just lying there. You know. You might, you know, somebody else will think, well, that's, you know, but again, you've got memories, you key that in with it. Of course, it's going to make it valuable. It makes it priceless. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wish I could talk to, you, talk to you for another hour. I'm enjoying it so much, but I have to wrap it up with a final question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your favorite thing to photograph? It could be a landscape, could be maybe some... Um, urban location could be a person. Favorite thing. Anything in this world. It changes. What about now? Music. Um especially being away from it for so long there's there's something about being wrapped up um in all that power all that emotion i'm in the photo pit i'm literally you know 3 feet away from the from the band 3 feet behind me is like you know whatever it will be 2000 to 20000 people and it's just like you're then capturing that so that people that weren't there will then see it and then go wow and that's what i mean about you know emotion i, I like to there's nothing quite like the euphoria of that and especially um unfortunately i've not been able to witness that yet um because i've just been so bogged down with with other bits of work namely wedding stuff but um I'll hopefully experience it at the end of this year, um, working for for a band that I know, and um, I can't wait. It's just it's gonna be it's gonna be something crazy. It really is. That actually might make me cry. Will you be happy with that? I think I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's again it fluctuates. It can be it can be music. It can be portrait. Um, obviously, I've been doing a lot of portraiture um, over the past kind of year or so um, with with my project and um, just with, with band stuff as well. But it's weirdly, it's not having a plan. I'm, I'm going, I'm going to a venue to, to photo a band. I haven't got a plan. How can you plan for that? They're going to be live on stage. They're going to be in your face. They're going to be moving up and down, whatever it will be. They'll be in the crowd. It doesn't matter. And I like that. I would probably say this is going to be cliched as crazy, but I would probably say that I'm free. I'm actually free to have complete and utter um, creative control. Um, that's probably the wrong word. I was on something so good then. Just not knowing, not knowing what I'm going to capture. Um, being completely free 
to know that I don't know what I'm going to be capturing. So then capturing something makes you go, wow. And especially if you get that shot that then brings that, you know, emotion across. So I'd probably say, yeah, definitely 100% music. Yeah. Oh, Carl, thank you for thank you for your time. My pleasure.